Today we're going to expound from 127th Psalm in the first verse, where the psalmist wrote, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Is it really possible for people to be building the Lord's house but wasting their time? Is it really, is it really possible for people to be building something called a church, but they're wasting their time, they're laboring in vain? Uh, I've been saved since 1969. I've been in all kinds of churches, Baptist churches, uh, Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, and even in a cult. And I know that all the messages that are going out to the public out there are things that go around Christ but never really focus or center on Christ. Well, we're going to look today in the Word of God to see what the Word of God says because the Holy Ghost teaches us words, words which the Spirit teaches, Paul said, comparing spiritual things with what? Carnal? No, spiritual things with spiritual. And so we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture so that we do not take the word out of its context. So, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, excuse me, not chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 3, 11, he said, For other foundation can no man lay. We are the ones that lay the foundation. The preacher does. But what is the foundation? It's God's foundation. Now, a somebody who claims to be building a church, but is building it on another foundation, is wasting his time. He's wasting his time. You can have all the right doctrines from the Scripture. You can have all of these things. You can know Scriptures. But if you don't know how to put them together to build the Lord's house, and the people will not be edified. The people will not be built up according to the way God would build His church. No other foundation can you lay except Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel? Paul gave us the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, how that he was buried and was raised again according to the scriptures on the third day. And this is the good news. All right. So the first thing people need to hear about is Jesus. Amen. People need to hear about Jesus. No other foundation. If, if a person is going to be built up in the Lord, their foundation must be Jesus Christ. Say it, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay, now, let us look at this here. Where did I put my... Here's the foundation for the temple. Jesus Christ. All right. Now, we look at all the doctrines that are taught to the church today. Sanctification, uh, holiness, the same thing. Sanctification and holiness. Uh, divine healing, salvation, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. All of these things. Righteousness. Okay. Okay. What is the foundation of salvation? Comes out of Jesus Christ. Sanctification. Sanctification comes out of the foundation of Jesus Christ. It grows. It grows. What do you mean by grows? The whole temple, Paul said, groweth into an holy temple in the Lord. Okay, how does it grow into a holy temple? Okay, all of these things, sanctification, salvation, uh, justification, healing, 
healing. Baptism with the Spirit. If these scriptural doctrines are not based on Jesus, then you can get up and preach about holiness all day long, but if Jesus isn't the source of your holiness, then you're just not doing things because the Bible says not to do it. That's what the Ten Commandments is about. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. Uh, you have to keep the Sabbath day. All these things. Okay, because a lot of churches teach about salvation, but Jesus isn't the focus. They teach about sanctification, but Jesus isn't the focus. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians, For Christ is made unto us, what? Wisdom, sanctification, redemption. Christ is our sanctification. It's not how you dress. That has nothing to do with being sanctified. Sanctification means set apart. How many agree that sanctification means set apart? Okay, let's say I have a specific pen. It's my favorite pen, and I don't want anybody else using it because it's very expensive and it's very precious to me, so I always keep it on my person. It's sanctified, isn't it? It's set apart for my use exclusively. Okay? You've been bought with a price, have you not? With what? The precious blood of Christ. Amen. He, that's the payment that makes you belong to God. Okay? And you belong to Him, and He doesn't want the devil putting his hands on you. Amen? Amen. He doesn't want the world to use you because you are specifically chosen for His purpose, for His use, and for His ministry. So, you have been set apart by God. Now, what severs you from the world? The fact that you are born of the Spirit, they are born of the flesh. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is what? Spirit. 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 So, we were born the first time of the flesh, but we're born the second time of what? The Spirit. Hallelujah. So, what are we now? We're, spirit, we're spiritual in the Lord. We are spiritual creatures. We no longer serve God by the flesh, offering up sacrifices, washing our hands at the laver. No, we have a spiritual water. We are washed with clean water, it says in the book of Hebrews. Okay, so... The Lord washed us, He cleansed us, He set us apart, He put His nature in us, He put His seed into us. And so, we are separated because Jesus is in us. He's our salvation. The Lord is our righteousness, therefore we are justified. That's justification. What is your righteousness? Well, I pray three hours a day. I read my Bible faithfully. That's not your righteousness. Your righteousness is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Say it, Christ in me. Christ in me. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. The only reason I'm going to be glorified is because Christ is in me. All right? And John put the bottom line as this. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. Okay, so you may be keeping the Sabbath day, but that doesn't give you life. And you'll never have life keeping Sabbath days and all these other things. Jesus is our Sabbath, right? He is our rest. He said the, the Sabbath, the rest of God, is no longer a 24-hour day from Friday evening to Saturday evening. But what is it? Christ in you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Right. rest. I'll give you Shabbat. I'll give you Sabbath. So everything is wrapped up in Jesus. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle was Jesus. The temple was Jesus. The holy place was Jesus. The menorah was Jesus. The showbread was Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat was Jesus. The badger skins was His humanity. All of these things, His divinity and His humanity merged together into one. Pillars of gold, but covered with badger skins. Red badger skins. And, and, and so that dyed red, which symbolizes, represents what? The blood of Christ. So we abide under the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. So what am I doing? I'm ministering to you the Word of God with Jesus as the focus and with Jesus as 
the foundation. Okay, so if the church is built on Jesus, then the true salvation is based on Jesus. The true sanctification is Jesus. The true justification is Jesus, as the, the, the prophet said, the Lord our righteousness. Okay, healing is based on Jesus. How do I get healed? You preach the healer. That's the foundation for healing, Jesus Christ. Okay, we were discussing with Robert about the casting out of demons. All right, I've seen devils cast out. Well, what are you talking about? It's all how? In the name of Jesus. Jesus is what? The foundation. You don't cast out devils in your name. You don't cast out devils in someone else's name. Even the sons of Siva in the book of Acts, they tried to cast the devils out of a man in Jesus whom Paul preached, but that wasn't good enough because they were not vested with the authority to use that name because they were not, their life wasn't, didn't have Jesus in it. You have to know Jesus and possess Jesus to use the name of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And how is the ch what is the church? Wherever two or three are gathered, what? In my what? In my name. In the name of Jesus Christ. How do we cast out devils? In the name of Jesus Christ. How do we heal the sick? In the name of Jesus Christ. You cannot divorce Jesus at any point of ministry from your ministry. Okay, there's churches that have, uh, they'll have, let's say, marriage seminars, okay? Oh, husbands should be this way, and wives should be this way, and they'll teach all these practical things, but it's not, if it's not based on Jesus, even Paul, when he preached, when he taught about the husband and the wife in the epistles, he said, husbands love your wives, how? As, the, as Christ loved the church, and gave himself for the church. I've been in churches where uh, people say, if you, if you spend more time with your kids and with your wife and that keeps you out of church, then you love them more than God. They're your God. No, that's a lie. Because you are serving God by giving your life for your wife and, and raising up, nurturing your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Now, what was the problem with Billy Sunday? We hear a lot about Billy Sunday. Oh, he was this great preacher that traveled around the country preaching against uh, alcohol and all this kind of stuff, but he lost his own family. His, whole fa his own children never served the Lord. Why? Because their mom and dad was always out doing supposedly work for God. God's work is for a husband to love his wife and for a father to, to nurture his children. If, and if you give all your time to ministry and to church and all their programs, and you don't have time, personal time with your wife and your kids, then you're failing God. You are not serving God. You're, you say, well, I'm serving God because it's the church. No, 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 no. You're violating the word of God. You need to balance it to where you have... So what are we talking about here? We're talking about except the Lord build the house. Okay? The holy temple and the Lord grows only when it's Jesus Christ is central. Only when Jesus Christ is central. Okay? As we said before, in Acts, uh, in the book of Acts, the Bible said that the apostles, that they, every day, daily, from house to house, and in the temple, they never stopped teaching and preaching what? Jesus Christ. Christ. They never ran out of subjects to deal with in preaching Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ covers everything. He covers the marriage. He covers the children. He covers uh, uh, every aspect of your life. He's your hospital. He's your doctor. He's your healer. He is your healer. All right, so let's go on and see just how the early church preached and taught. Okay, they followed through on this. Okay, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. Okay, now let's look at how God builds the church. Thank you. Let's look at the building blocks. We just looked at the ministry based on the foundation. Now let's look at the let's look at how God builds his church. 
on the foundation, Jesus Christ. First, number one, apostles. Or missionaries. Two, prophets. Three, teachers. We're in First Corinthians, and now we're in First Corinthians twelve. And verse twenty eight. After that, miracles. Oh my. And then, after miracles, gifts of healing. Now, it's not the gift of healing, but gifts of healing, because there's different ways this gift of healing operates. In one case, a woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was healed, right? In another case, he just spoke to the disease and it went away. In another case, he laid hands on them and they were healed. So, there are gifts of healing, different diseases, there are spirits of infirmity. So, can you see the problem when a church doesn't have this as one of their building blocks? What is it? They have a lot of people in their church that are getting sick. They go to the hospital. They're not following the direction of the scripture. They say, I believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. No, they don't. Because the Bible teaches in the book of James, if anyone is sick among you, he's supposed to do what? What's he supposed to do? Call for the elders of the church. Oh, call for the... Well, we prayed for so-and-so and they didn't get it. Did you call for the elders of the church like the Bible instructed? Well, no. Why didn't you? And so then the elder prayed for you, but he didn't, he didn't anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. So he said, well, oil doesn't heal anybody. Okay, so why did James encourage it then? It's an act of faith, like touching the hem of the garment. It's an aid to your faith. So, now if, you, if there's no elders around that, that can pray the prayer of faith or believe God, you know, then God, I believe, will heal you because you have no other recourse, right? But if you have elders, you should call them not elder, but plural, elders. Is that what the Bible said? Okay, so call for the elders of the church and that let them anoint the sick one with oil in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and the prayer of what will save the sick? Faith. The prayer of faith. Now praying, oh Lord, if it be thy will, heal this one. That's not the prayer of faith. <laughs> if it be thy will. The only thing we're instructed to pray, if it be thy will, and it's not in those exact words, is when people start boasting, oh, tomorrow we're going to do this, or next week we're going to do that. They're boasting what they're going to do. Well, we don't know what a week may hold, so that's evil to boast and say, we're going to do this. Wherefore, we should say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that, okay? Because I don't know what the Lord is going to will for me to do tomorrow, okay? So the, all such boasting is evil, James said. But where the Word of God does plainly give us His will then we can plainly pray the prayer of faith if we know that it is His will. Well, how can we know if something's His will? Let's look at Jesus again, okay? He healed them all. We don't say, well, He healed most of them, or He healed some of them. No, He healed all of them. Now, Jesus is the image of God. And Jesus said, I do whatever the Father Whatever I see the Father doing. And so the reason why Jesus healed them all was because he saw the Father healing them all. <laughs> so Jesus is the perfect will of God. And God gives us his will in the scripture so that we can pray the prayer of faith without what? Without wavering. For he that wavers is like a, sand, the, a wave of the sea. And let not that man think that he shall receive what? Anything from the Lord. Okay. So we're going to base our faith on the ministry of Jesus. And everywhere he went, the people were healed, except where they did not believe on him. People don't get saved unless they believe in him. People don't get healed unless you believe in him. 
Well, how do we know if people believe in him? Because they will come to him wanting to be healed. Now, one man, he came without even a perfect faith. He said, Lord, I know you can heal me, but I don't know if you will heal me. That was the leper. And he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I know you can make me clean, but I don't know if it's your will. Okay, because he didn't have a Bible and didn't, couldn't read all the passages where he saw Jesus healing everybody that believed. And G, what did Jesus tell him? Well, because you don't have, because you're doubting, I'm not going to heal. No, he didn't say that. He said, I will be thou cleansed. All right? So even that man, Another man who wanted the demons cast out of his son because his son would manifest rolling on the ground and throwing himself into the fire and trying to drown himself. He was suicidal. He said, Lord, he said, Jesus asked him if he could, if he could believe that he would do it. And, and he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Okay, now, you say, well, unbelief can't get anything from God. So how could this man have faith to believe for his son because he looked to the author of faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of what? Our faith, right? And so because he looked to Jesus for the faith, Jesus gave him the faith and he cast the demon out of his son or the demons. All right, so what is it? Looking to Je Jesus has to be the focal point in everything. All right, so now, the church, here's the elements of a church that's being built by God. There will be missionaries, there will be prophets, there will be teachers. Now, in the book of Ephesians, it's called pastor teachers. Notice, it's in what? What does an S at the end of a noun mean? Plural. Plural. There's no such thing in the early church as there being a pastor. That began with Western civilization under Constantine, and where they had a pulpit and everybody else sat out there and they were spectators and not participators. And one man becomes the great icon of the church. Oh, you need to meet my pastor. There were more than one pastor. The, the word pastor, when Peter preached, when Peter was teaching in his epistle, he said, and ye elders feed the flock of who? God. It's not your flock. They're not your people. You don't possess them. There were elders, there were presbyters, there were deacons in the church. Well, what was the pastor? Those who feed the flock. What's that? A teacher, right? And so the word pastor isn't even mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, when Paul gave, listed what God put into the church. He didn't even say pastors. Teachers covered it. Notice plural. Every one of you hath a doctrine. Every one of you has a psalm or a teaching or this. The, church, the early church gathered together not under one man. They were all participants in ministry. Today, God may use Ian to lay hands on somebody to be healed. Tomorrow, he may, he may use Robert to give a prophecy. He may use me to interpret it if the prophecy comes forth in other tongues. Okay, but everything has to be interpreted for the edifying of the church. So, if it's a prophecy, God's going to let you know what he's talking about. He's not going to speak to you in another tongue you don't understand, and then it not be interpreted. Okay, so... All of these things are necessary in God's church. This is God's church. This is God's house. Not a building, but the, but the ministry that takes place therein. If there's not apostles, if there's not prophets, if there's not teachers, if there aren't miracles happening in the church, if there's no healings taking place in the church, then it's not God's church. Does that make sense? You're laboring in vain. And there's so many churches out there, they do not practice the ministry of healing. I praise indeed. They do not practice the ministry of healing. So, what are you talking about? I'm talking about God's church. Are we laboring in vain? 
Because there's a lot of churches that think they're God's church. And they don't have pastors, they have a pastor. There, a pastor was never meant to rule everybody. The elders, those who have been saved for a period of time, have been proven and have been ordained or appointed by an apostle. They do have authority in the church. But they're not the only one that can prophesy. They're not the only one that can lay hands on people or cast out demons or teach. No, everybody can be used of the Lord. If we read the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for to one is given this gift, and to another this gift. God giveth to all men to profit with all. God gives these gifts to everybody in the church. Everybody in the church should be able to prophesy. Okay. But what about the scripture where it says, well, all, do all speak with tongues? Do all prophesy? Yes, all can prophesy. All can speak with tongues because they were in Corinth. They were all coming together and all they were doing was speaking in tongues. And they thought they were being super spiritual because they were talking to each other in tongues. And yet they didn't even understand what each other was saying. Okay, so when Paul said, do all, does everybody in the church, he wasn't talking about that they couldn't speak in tongues. He was saying this, that when we come together as a body, we need to let the Spirit operate in all of the various gifts in order and decently. Okay, so although we can all speak in tongues, we're not all going to come together and just speak in tongues. No. No. If all the body were a hand or a foot or an eye, then where, where, where's the body? Okay, <laughs> so every part of my body functions for the betterment of the whole. My feet function to get me to the store. My hands function to pay the bill. My eyes function to see where I'm going. My ears function to hear what people are communicating to me. My mouth functions to speak to others. That, that's called communication. So all the gifts are necessary. Healing is necessary for when people get sick. And people are always getting sick uh, in, in most churches. Uh, prophecy is important. Now, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he said, it's better if you all prophesy. He said, if everyone prophesies and there comes in one who is unlearned, ignorant, or un, an unbeliever, he is convinced by everybody, he is judged by everybody, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and confess that God is in you people of a truth. Okay, so what's Paul saying? Everybody in the church, when everybody prophesies, then there will be people get saved because prophesying is an instrument of the Spirit in the church to convince people that God is real. I've seen people convince that God is real by seeing people get miraculously healed before their eyes. What is that? That's God saying, I'm here in this place. That's why this person got healed. You know it's a miracle when somebody gets healed. So, and if they get healed, you know it wasn't the preacher that healed them. And you know it wasn't man that healed them. So it had to be God. And so every healing is evidence that God is present. All right. Now what happened on the day of Pentecost? The sound of a rushing mighty wind. Flames of fire descending upon the 120 people. Every, everybody looked like a, a, a menorah or, or, or a candlestick. They had the fire over their heads, and they were speaking, they were prophesying, but it was in other foreign languages that they had never learned, so that was miraculous. Okay, so the, 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 it was noised abroad, and people came, Jews from every different uh, area that spoke a second language as well as Aramaic or Hebrew. And so when they got there, uh, look at that woman's preaching in my language. Another one said, hey, he's speaking in my tongue. And, and, and they knew these were Galileans, and so they were ignorant and uneducated as far as uh, the world considers as education. And here they are fluently speaking in these languages. And so they knew something has to be miraculous here. Okay, and they sensed that God was present. And so it was God revealing himself through a miracle 
to these people to let them know what Peter was about to say was from him, that, th that this was God in this meeting, and the message, the gospel they were about to hear about the Messiah they had crucified, Jesus of Nazareth, they were going to find out that he really was the Messiah, and they made a huge boo-boo by, by crucifying him, okay? And so they needed to repent of that. But when they all said, what meaneth this? And somebody said, these men are drunken. Peter said, these people aren't drunk. Is she supposing it's only nine o'clock in the morning? This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out what my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall what? Prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. What was Peter saying? What you're seeing and hearing is proof that Jesus, the one you crucified, is risen and gone back to the right hand of God and has poured out his spirit upon these people. Every miracle that God works that people see and hear is proof that Jesus is alive, that he's raised from the dead and that he's gone back to the Father and he's poured out his spirit upon the church. Okay, so every miracle is proof of Jesus' resurrection. And that's why he said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Why do I need supernatural power to be a witness? Can I just tell people, oh, he's risen? No, you, mu you must back up your word with proof that Jesus has risen by healing the sick, by casting out evil spirits, by raising the dead. All of these things are evidence that Jesus is alive because you're doing it in his name and the people can see visibly what God is doing in their very midst. And they know it has to be God because they know humans could never do these things. All right? So, like at the Azusa Street Revival, the man came up, his arm had been severed at the shoulder. He had no arm. And, and William Seymour, <laughs> the preacher, called him up and asked the brethren if they wanted to pray for him and see God work a miracle. And they laid their hands on this man and, and one brother said he saw the arm grow out from the empty socket and the hand come on and the fingers grow out on the hand with the fingernails. Now that's, that's, a, that's a fast miracle, would you say? That's not gradual. That's an instantaneous miracle. Okay, and that's those are the kind of miracles that happen on Azusa Street. Well, Azusa Street wasn't the abnormal, that was the norm of the church, and that's supposed to be the norm of the church. You know, it's wonderful to get together and, and when you got a, gr a great crowd of people and you all lift up your voices and begin to sing and to praise the Lord, that's awesome, but that's not the end all of church. It didn't say he built his church on singing and musicians and all that. No, he built his church on these specific ministries that he placed into his church. And if those ministries aren't there, then you're laboring in vain if you're trying to build a church. All right? That's not my word. This is, the, this is what Paul said. Paul said, God set these into the church. So if, any, if, if healings are missing from your church, if miracles are missing from your church, then you're not building God's church. You're laboring in vain according to the Bible. Because the Bible said, except the Lord builds a house. And when the Lord builds a house, He sets into the house apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, and so on. And the church then grows from Jesus Christ. Because the apostles go forth into foreign lands and preach to those who have never heard the gospel. What are they preaching? They're preaching Jesus Christ. What do the prophets preach? They preach Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verses 4 through 8. Let's look at Philip. Let's look at Philip. He was a deacon. Now Philip and Stephen, if you read in Acts chapter 7, or Acts chapter 6, rather, they, they worked miracles among the people. Stephen worked great miracles among the people. Deacons should be able to work miracles. And there's churches where even the pastors can't work miracles because the pastors themselves aren't convinced that miracles are for today. Okay, or they doubt that God will use them. So they say, oh, let's all pray for sister so-and-so. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
And they don't look for the miracle. I, I prayed for a brother, Brother Keith Rodriguez up in Washington last night. He also escaped from the cult. He's been calling me and I've been teaching him over the phone and sharing with him over the phone. And he said, could you pray for me before we hang up? I said, what's wrong? He said that he was having pain in the ball joint of his hip. Okay. So he asked me to pray. So I had him pray with me and I prayed and I commanded the pain to leave the ball joint in his hip and that he was healed. And I had him confess that, to say, Jesus, as you are, so am I in this world. And so then we said, Amen. And I said, Okay, now stand up and walk around. So I could hear him. He was standing up. He was walking around in his, in his RV. And I said, Now stomp your foot on the ground three times. Man, he was so odd because he said he was healed. The pain was gone. And I'm telling you today that if we will believe and pray like we believe, and I say, Well, I hope the Lord will heal you. That's not, that's not the prayer of faith. That's wavering. Well, I, maybe God will, maybe God... So if, God, if it's all up to God anyway, why even bother to pray? If God's the one that's going to determine what He wants done, then your praying is a waste of time in the first place. It's a waste of time to pray for the sick if God might not heal them. <laughs> that's presumptuous, isn't it? Of course it is. And everybody that came to Jesus got healed. So... Now, if we could find one passage in the Gospels where somebody came to Jesus and, and they said, Lord, please heal me of my blindness. And Jesus says to them, well, brother, you know, God's will is for you to be blind so that you can be a testimony to other blind people. No, 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 no. You don't read that. You don't read that at all. Never, never. Okay. Some people say, well, God's trying to teach me a lesson. So he made me sick. Really? God uses scripture to correct us and to rebuke us. He doesn't make us sick. All, all sickness comes from the devil. All spirits of infirmity. Never once in the Bible did it say that people were made sick by God. In fact, if Jesus went around healing them all, and it was God's will for some of them to be sick, then Jesus was violating God's sovereign will by healing them. God's sovereign will spoke that it is His will for us to be healed. By whose stripes you were what? healed. Now if by his wounds and his hands and his feet the nails where he shed his blood from and his side, if it's God's will for everybody to believe that and be saved, then we'll have to say that we believe that he's received the stripes and the wounds for everybody to be healed as well. Not, oh well, he only wants some people healed, but he, only, but he wants everybody saved. You've got, you got to rewrite the Bible to make it say that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Okay, Acts chapter 10. Therefore they, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching what? The Word. What was the Word? Christ. Because it says in the very next verse, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. What did he preach? He didn't pre carry a sign and say, Repent you sinners and get right with God or you're going to go straight to hell. That's not what the gospel, that's not the good news. That is not the good news. We haven't come to the Mount Sinai, as it says in the book of Hebrews. We didn't come to the Mount which might be touched, where even if an animal transgressed, it was thrust through with a dart. That's not where we've come to. We've gone from the Old Covenant into a New Covenant. The letter kills, but the Spirit came to give us life. All right, Mount Sinai kills, but Mount Zion brings life. At the foot of Mount Sinai, 3,000 were killed, worshiping the golden calf. At Mount Zion, in the book of Acts, 3,000 were saved under the ministry of Peter. What was it? That's the contrast between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Amen. If you try to keep the Old Covenant, you're going to die. If you're keeping the New, which is two commands only, what is that? Believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And number two, love one another as He gave His commandment. That's pretty simple, isn't it? God, what is God looking for? Our love, as Brother Robert said. You know, you can have all the right doctrines, but if you don't love one another, doctrine isn't going to get you into heaven. All right, so Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, how did he do it? He told them, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and He was raised again for your justification. And if you will call on His name, He will save you. And He has given us power through His 
kingdom come to earth to heal and to cast out demons and to make everyone every wood whole. Look at this. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake. Why? Hearing and seeing. Say it, hearing and seeing. Hearing and seeing. The miracles which he did. And what were the miracles? For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, which is was actually paralysis, and that were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Well, was, Peter wasn't just saying Jesus will save you from your sins. He was telling them that Jesus would heal them of their diseases, that he would make the lame to walk, the dumb to speak, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. That was all part of the good news. And then he demonstrated the truth of what he was preaching to them by, by healing them in the name of Jesus. So, you see, there's more to the gospel than just talk. As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, our gospel did not come to you only in words, but in power and in the Holy Ghost. Listen to Paul in Romans 15, 19. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached, what? The gospel of Christ. The gospel of who? Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. Everywhere Paul went, he preached good news. It was good news to the lame. It was good news to the blind. It was good news to the deaf. It was good news to the diseased. It was good news to the demon-possessed. It was good news to those who were lost and were not saved. Why? Because they found out they did not have to continue in their fallen condition that they received under Adam, that the curse was removed, that Christ was made a curse for us so we could be blessed, that He died for us so we could live, that He was made sick and diseased on the cross so that our diseases and sicknesses would be removed. That He was made sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God. Everything, the cross is the doorway out of the old life into the new, from the curse into the blessing, from death unto life, from enemies of God into the sons of God. He was forsaken and rejected by, by God on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if we could God, hear God answering back, he might be saying something like this, I had to forsake you so that I could receive and accept them to myself. Oh, so what do we have here? We have the miracle gospel of Jesus Christ. And a gospel with no miracles and a gospel with no supernatural accompaniment is not the good news. All right, so what do we have in the early, test, early ministry of the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and, and all of this. We don't have just one pastor, we have multiple pastors, teachers. We don't have just one prophet, everybody can prophesy. We don't just have one worker of miracles, everybody can work miracles, if they believe. And if God has called them into the ministry, and He has, because we have been called, justified, and we're already as good as glorified, past tense, glorified, Romans chapter 8, from the mind of Paul. Okay, so what is the early church? The early church is built on the message of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ, the miracles of Jesus Christ, the healing of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ from beginning to end. It, everything grows out of that foundation into a holy temple. Sanctification is Jesus Christ. Redemption is Jesus Christ. Healing is the healer, Jesus Christ. The baptism with the Spirit, the empowering of the Spirit, is the empowering of Jesus Christ. So why did Jesus empower us with the baptism of the Spirit? So that we could demonstrate what we preach. So that we could manifest these miracles, these healings, among the people today in the churches. Amen. God bless you.